It's always interesting to see how people respond to this poll. <coughs> Okay, well, I think we'll go ahead and get started. So let me tell you a little bit about myself and what I hope to do here first. Um, my name is Ann Barker. I'm one of the reference librarians here at Ellis Library. And I'm not an expert on copyright. So I'm sort of the designated person here, but I have no legal credentials at all. So what I can do is give you a general framework of how copyright law works, things you should be concerned about, and then point you to some sources of information. But since I have no legal credentials, I can't give you any legal advice. Um, so take that with a grain of salt. Um, since we've done this quiz, I want to kind of start with this. Um, and let's see. Now, can we go to the slide that shows which things are covered by copyright? Let me pull that one up. OK. You all are pretty good on knowing what things are covered by copyright. So it used to be that anything covered by copyright had to have a little C in a circle, which you can see down in the lower left there. It had to be registered with the Copyright Office. But that has not been true since around 1992 when we joined the World Intellectual Property Organization. Um, so now anything that is uh, any work of authorship fixed in a tangible mode of expression is automatically covered by copyright. So everything, the class notes, student homework, old love letters, email, YouTube videos, Google images, they're all by default covered by copyright. So unless explicitly said otherwise, we should assume that things are covered by copyright. Most government publications are not. Most government publications automatically go into the public domain. So they're free to, for use. It may depend a little bit on whether they were contracted to a different agency, to a commercial entity, or if they're a state or local government. But federal, U.S. federal government publications are free to use. On the right, the map from the 19th century, that is so old that that has already gone into the public domain. So now the next slide we could look at would be how long does copyright last? Whoops. It would be the other one. OK, this one. Um, when copyright law started in the United States, it initially the term was only for 14 years. And the idea was that that would give the creative person time to get return on their investment, and then other people would be able to build on their work. And if it was still commercially viable, the copyright holder could renew the copyright for another 14 years. So it could be 28 years. But this has gotten longer and longer over time, particularly as we've come into coordination with other countries. So now the general rule is that things are covered by copyright for 70 years after the death of the author. So a long, long time. And then in some cases, even longer. So if, if there is no identifiable author, it might be covered for 95 years after publication. Or if it's not been published, but it's in manuscript form, it might be covered even longer. So we'll look at how you can tell if something is still covered by copyright or not. It can get a little tangled to figure out. Then now, if we could look at the last slide, the um, one on what the exclusive rights are. <coughs> OK. All, what are these? Five, one, two, three, four, five. All of these five things are actually exclusive <laughs> rights of the copyright holder. So to publicly display something, which could mean just to hold it up and show it in a classroom, potentially, or to perform something publicly, to sing something on speaker circle, making any kind of reproduction, distributing in any way, passing something on by email, for example, or making a derivative work, creating an anthology or doing a parody, making something else. These are all exclusive rights of the copyright holder, initially. So when you look at this, it can feel like, you know, we really can't do anything, that everything is all locked up. And that's actually not the case. There are some exemptions and some other ways to get around these things. But keep in mind, these are the rights that the creative person has with their work as a baseline. And then these get modified. So what we're going to do now is look at our copyright guide that we have at the library, which just walks you through the process of figuring out what you can and can't do. And again, it doesn't cover all of, all of the different parameters and wrinkles. It will give you the main outline of how copyright works and where you can go to find things out. So let me see if I can work this correctly. 
we're going to start out at the library webpage. If you want to follow along on your computers, I've got control of your screen, so you can click through things and look at things as you wish, and then if I feel I need to show you something, I can just take you there. So we're going to start out at the library webpage, which should come up on your screen. I think if you're in Collaborate, because that comes up on the distance learner screen. So if you all want to follow along and do that here. Okay, try library.missouri.edu. There you go. Alrighty, from the main library page, you'll see an index near the top of the screen where it says libraries A to Z. And if you'll click on that, and then click on the C, you'll see this link to copyright information. And that's where you want to go. If you just type in copyright as a search, every single page we have has a copyright notice on it, so it can get a little confusing. So you want to go through the index to get there. And we'll start here with the begin here. This just gives you a quick overview of how to determine what you can do. So as I mentioned, copyright covers original works of authorship fixed and any tangible medium of expression. So it's particularly protecting the expression, not necessarily the ideas behind them. This is automatic from the moment of creation. That means almost everything is covered by copyright. So your first step in looking at copyright stuff is to see, is it covered? Is it the type of work that's covered? So pretty much everything is. Um, and then the next step would be to see, is it in the public domain? And that means has it gone out of copyright? We're going to come back and look at the details, but just to walk through the steps. So you need to check to see if something's in the public domain. If it is, even under those circumstances, you might also want to check to see, is it a licensed work? Um, licensing comes under contract law, and generally it trumps copyright. So if you've got an explicit license to something, you have to follow those specific directions. Um, and copyright doesn't necessarily kick in in the same way. So for example, for most of our electronic resources in the library, those are all licensed resources. And what we can do with them is determined by the license. Generally, it's going to allow you to link to things, but not necessarily download them and repost them. So you're going to want to generally link to things. You might also want to see if your department has licensed something. So for example, in engineering, they might have a license to particular software that describes how that can be used. Um, or there might be a blanket license. So for example, the University General Council has a blanket license for the whole campus covering musical performances. So we don't have to go and get permission for every single musical performance. They have a contract with ASCAP to cover all of those things. So you can check on that. And the other thing to see if the work you want to use is covered by a Creative Commons license. This is a relatively new form of licensing that you can use yourself. Um, and it allows someone who holds the copyright to say it's okay for people to use this in certain ways. So they can give those permissions ahead of time instead of waiting for someone to approach them. So first find out if what you're wanting to deal with is covered by copyright at all. Um, then if it's not in the public domain or licensed, then there might be a specific exemption. So for example, for teaching, the copyright law contains specific exemptions that says it's okay to do this in the classroom, even though you would be going beyond what is the um, exclusive right of the copyright holder. You're allowed to do specific things, first in the general classroom, and then the TEACH Act adapted that for online teaching. So we'll get into some of those things as well. And there was also the Digital Millennium Copyright Act, which updated the law. Again, technology is kind of driving the law. So it deals with encryption, what you can do if you need to crack the encryption to do something, and also the responsibilities of internet service providers. So we'll look at that a little bit in a moment, too. The final thing, or the third thing, um, say you're looking at something that's covered by copyright, there's not a license, um, the specific exemptions don't seem to apply, then you fall back on what's called fair use. And the copyright law contains some fair use principles. They're not specific guidelines, so they don't come down to page numbers or anything like that, but there's some general principles that you can look at to determine, is my use fair or not? And we'll talk about some ways that you can evaluate that yourself. Then if none of these things apply, you're probably going to have to get permission. And we've got some um, mechanisms that will help you with doing that. So that's kind of a general framework of how things work. So let's go through some of the specific things. We've kind of outlined most of these things at the top under these different tabs. So first thing, just to see if what you want to use is in the public domain. Um, 
since the copyright term has changed over time, what's in the public domain has changed over time. So this goes into some details about how that works, but if we scroll down, this would usually appear as a sidebar. And there are some nice charts that help you. So one of my favorites is this chart from Cornell, where they've outlined every possibility. <laughs> so you start out with the work never published and never registered. It will tell you how long the term lasts and then what date things start to go into the public domain. And these terms turn over on January 1st in US law every year. So this goes through things that were never published, things that were registered. You can see for some reason, for some years, it was published without a copyright notice. It might be in the public domain. If it was with a copyright notice, you might need to check to see if it's been renewed. Um, after a certain date, then it's going to be covered for quite a long time. But this kind of takes you through all the different steps to see what's, what's still in the public domain and what isn't. If you're not sure, we also, I'm not going to go into these details, but we do have some ways for you to check. So the Copyright Office retains the register of copyright. So for something older, if you need to see was the copyright renewed, then you can take a look in those records and see was it renewed or not. That's for checking on the dates. Then if you want to see, if you're particularly dealing with the classroom thing, you want to see if what you're going to do is fair, this outlines some of the sections that are allowed um, for classes. So this allows in a classroom setting for you to hold up a book or a picture, for example, and show that. That would otherwise be a public display. You could read something aloud. You could play a video within that context. So it describes here it has to be face-to-face -face teaching in a nonprofit educational institution in a classroom. Um, and in the case of a motion picture or other audiovisual work, it has to be given by means of a copy that was procured legally. So it couldn't be something that you grabbed off of some illegal motion picture site. You need to have bought a copy of the video to then show in class. <clears throat> now the TEACH Act goes on and expands that. This was passed when online teaching began to be more prevalent and a lot of the um, providers of materials were concerned that students could download things and then pass them on to their friends and they wanted to put some more parameters on this and define a little bit. So generally, if, you're, if you've made your online space similar to a physical classroom where it's restricted, the access is restricted to people enrolled in the class, then you can do a lot within that. So instead of it being a face-to-face -face session, it, it is um, limited in that space. They do allow Let's see here. They allow the full performance of a variety of things. And then for other things, if they get more dramatic or creative, creative, more creative, fictitious kind of works tend to be more protected. They limit that to reasonable and limited portions. So really only the portions that you need to make your point in the class. So you couldn't necessarily play an entire opera or an entire musical you might assign that for the students to watch on their own at some other time, but in the classroom setting or the, the online classroom setting, you would want to show just the portions that are needed to make your point. They also try to protect things that are marketed as textbooks. So if it is a video that was made for an educational purpose or if it's a workbook or a textbook, you really can't reproduce those and distribute them because that would be undercutting the market. You can see down at the bottom some other obligations that have to be met. So it needs to be under the supervision of the instructor, related to the class content, so not just something to amuse your students, but to actually teach them something. Part of systematic instruction, made only to those students in the class. And then you have to take reasonable steps to try to prevent them from otherwise downloading and spreading things further. Um, and it has to have some sort of a warning on it. So I think, um, the folks at ET at Mo are certainly aware of this, so Blackboard accommodates most of these things. So I think you're in pretty good shape for doing what you would need to do in an online teaching setting. Any questions on this so far? Making sense? Okay. I think this is fairly straightforward. Um, let me mention the DMCA also. So this probably comes up more in the case of engineering classes. 
since it deals with encryption. So it can affect your teaching if you're needing to break the encryption in order to do things. We run into this sometimes in the library in cases where we've got a video that's in a foreign regional format and we want it to be able to play on US equipment without having to change the um, setting all the time. So the DMCA does allow some circumvention of those encryptions to allow some things that are um, useful. It's been changing a lot, so this is the sort of thing the Copyright Office does is they pass the law, they make regulations, and then they revisit those. They know the technology is not going to stay the same. So we do have a link down here on the exceptions. And every three years, the Copyright Office reviews the rules. They make new exceptions or exemptions to the law. So you just kind of keep up to date on keep looking at this. Um, so a recent one that was made was specifically dealing with documentary filmmaking or film studies classes and allowing them to do some things that others might not be able to do. This could also come up, I think, with studying software. You, know, you might want to reverse engineer something in order to be able to look at it. And again, I'd have to check the specific exemptions to see what's allowed under that. Um, but the DMCA was made to, to try to address that. It also pertains to internet service providers, and we'll get into that a little bit later when we get into things for penalties and liabilities. <clears throat> this was to help internet service providers, like the university that provides all of us with our internet access, from being held liable for violations by people who are using that, uh, that network. So if they follow certain guidelines, then they won't be held responsible. So we'll, we'll look at that in a moment. Okay. So if you've gone through all of these specific things to see if what you're doing is okay and you're not finding an explicit permission to do what you want to do, the next step is to take a look at fair use. And fair use can be a little complicated. Um, it weighs four different things and you have to weigh all of them together. So one is the purpose of the use. A lot of times in an educational setting, people will say, well, I'm using it for an educational purpose, so it's okay, right? Well, no. <laughs> Unfortunately, that's only one of the factors, and you have to look at the other factors as well. So um, the educational use weighs heavily, so being able to comment on something, make criticism, talk about it, teach it, is a big plus that weighs in favor of fair use, but you also have to look at these other things. So the nature of the copyrighted work, as I mentioned before, things that are more creative are more protected. I think that's because copyright protects the expression, and in a novel or a poem or a musical piece, it's hard to separate the expression from the content. If it's a more factual thing like news reporting, it's probably easier to separate out that expression from the content that's being expressed, so it's a little less protected than something that's more creative in some sense. The amount and substantiality of the portion is also important, and it's not just the amount, but also the substantiality. So you might take a very small portion of something, but if it's the only portion that's really important to that work, that would be more protected. So a classic example is that, I think it was Newsweek scooped the biography of, or autobiography of Gerald Ford and they, before the publication of his autobiography, they printed the chapter where he talked about pardoning Nixon. Well, they were then sued by the publisher's autobiography with the point that the only part people really wanted to read was the part about for pardoning Nixon. <laughs> so they lost that suit. They had taken a very small portion of the book, but they had taken a part that was very important to the marketable, market viability of that work. So I sometimes think this is like, you know, if you weren't sharing a piece of cake with somebody, you know, you're expecting to take a little bite. You don't expect them to scrape all the icing off the top and take all the icing. You don't expect them to take three quarters of the piece of cake. So, you know, be respectful of the amount. It's the amount, it's not a set amount, but it's the amount in relationship to the whole. I can imagine some books where the whole part of it is a couple sentences. Right, yeah. So again, I think it's good just keeping much that balance in mind. You know, showing respect to someone else who's put some creative effort into something, but then also recognize that we build on others' creative efforts. So it's hitting that balance between those. Um, so the final part is the effect of the potential market. So again, you don't want to, the, the point of copyright is to allow the creative person to get some return on their investment. So you don't want to undercut the possibility for them to get some return on this. Um, what we find helpful in evaluating this, and what we would recommend is the fair use checklist. I'm going to click through to this so we can see this. Um, this comes to us from Columbia University Libraries. They are fortunate they have an entire office that deals just with 
um, copyright. And Kenneth Cruz, who is their guru there, has both a library degree and a law degree. So he's very well qualified to speak to these things. So I'd recommend anything that he's written, anything you find on this page is going to be just fantastic. So you get some backgrounds on using this list. And then at the bottom here, you've got to click through to. Okay, let me backtrack if I can. You're not controlling my screen. Oh, am I still not? I guess I'm controlling it just for the distance, people. Let's see if I can go back with this here. Did you get it from the fair news page? Yes. Okay. So if you're at this page with the fair use tab. It's actually in the text here. I think you may also be displaying as a sidebar. So I think we've got it also on the, in a separate box, the various checklists there. A lot of these tools that we have in, in the usual page usually displays as a sidebar. A lot of these tools are really quick, easy ways to find out things. So let's see if we went to Internet Explorer. And that's not going to display on the screen. Well. Copy paste it around and put it in Then it should do it. Let's see if I can do this. Will that do it? Okay. So, um, got two ATVs. Okay. Let me do this. Let me do this. <laughs> Now let's see if we can do it. Okay, this is nice. If you're if you're considering using something under fair use, we would really highly recommend you fill in this form and keep it. Um, if anyone ever disputed that what you did was fair. It's really helpful to have this on file. So you can say, I did consider that. I looked through this. I analyzed my use. As far as I could tell, this was a fair use. That can actually protect you from some damages if it ever went to a lawsuit. But it's just helpful to have a record of what your thinking was. So you can see it goes down under each thing. So under purpose, you can just tick down. OK, I'm using this for research or scholarship. If I'm using it for entertainment in my class, that may not be a good thing. But you can sort of tick off the different things and see what's favored, what's not. So you can see, again, under the nature of the work, it's going to favor things that are more factual or that have been published. If it's an unpublished work, it's a manuscript. Someone may still be working on it. They may not have finished creating it. They, you know, It's a little bit more protected than if it's been published. The amount, you can see it's a small quantity. The portion that's used is what you need to make your point rather than just sort of extraneous bits and it's not the heart of the work. Okay. <clears throat> Under the effect on the market here, um, you've got a lawfully acquired copy that you're copying from. And then also some other things. You're not making a whole lot of copies. And then there's no other similar product or there's no licensing mechanism. If there's a really easy way to get permission, like you can think on iTunes, it's easy to buy a track. That would argue against fair use, because if they've made it so easy for you to lawfully buy a copy, that that would be the way to go. So you can see it's opposing fair use if there's affordable permission available. Yes? I have a question. So if, if they wanted to uh, put it on Blackboard for your students, they're reading mm -hmm. would that go under do their own lawfully purchased or acquired copy? Like if it's an article that you can get from an online database within the university system? Uh, not quite, because if you're, if you're getting it from an online database in the library, that's actually a licensed resource. The university has, has established a license with the database provider to get that, mm -hmm. so you would need to follow the license agreement. Okay. And generally, the license agreement would say link to it. So rather than downloading it and then uploading it again in Blackboard, you would want to make a link from Blackboard into that specific article. And we have a guide on our web page. I think, are you Nigel? Did I email you back? I think I emailed you the link to the guide. I can show you that as well. So there is a way to link to a specific article. And then that passes your students right through. So that's whenever you can link to someone's resource online, that's much better than actually downloading it and uploading it again. So then if it's not linkable, but if it's an 
Then you would need to do this analysis. So I think you would probably be allowed to make a copy as long as it's limited to just the people in your class. So if it's password protected through Blackboard, I think that would be okay under the guidelines, under the exemptions for teaching. So you wouldn't even get as far as doing a fair use analysis. That would be provided for under the TEACH Act. I think that would make that possible. Um, I'm trying to think of an example for our class work. This might come up more like if you thought you needed to use more of a musical piece than might be appropriate under the TEACH Act. You might need to go through this analysis and say, yeah, I think this is okay as far as I can tell. This looks like it would be all right as a fair use. This probably, the fair use probably comes up more if you're going to publish something. So not so much in the classroom setting, but say you're going to use a graph or something in an article that you're publishing. You might go through the fair use analysis. So let's just do that as an example. So if you're going to write an article and you're looking at doing this for um, using a graph someone else has put in their work, you could say, well, this is for research, it's for scholarship, I'm doing it in a nonprofit environment, um, I'm criticizing and I'm commenting on it. So that all weighs in favor of fair use. You are going to publish it in a journal that is a commercial entity, so that would oppose it, but you've got much more weighing on the side of fair use in that case. And then if we look at the nature of it, well, it's been published. It's fairly factual. You could say it's a drawing. It's a graph, so in that sense it's creative. But if it's a pretty basic graph and it's just presenting, you know, here's a curve, <laughs> that's probably not highly creative. If it's an infographic, you know, with lots of creative expression in it, that might be more creative and that might weigh against it. But again, if it's important to your commenting, you're actually commenting on this graph, you kind of need to show the graph to be able to comment on it. So that would favor fair use. And the amount here, this gets complicated if you're dealing with a picture, because you're supposed to use a portion of something. If you're using an entire picture, you're not using a part of the picture, you're using the entire picture. Um, if the picture, yeah, or if it was one part of an article, you know, if that's just a portion of the article, right, or it's one graph of many, or you could sometimes say even if you're reproducing a picture by a photographer, it's one part of that whole photographer's work. You could maybe argue, argue that, particularly if it's appropriate for the educational purpose. If you really need to see the entire graph in order to make your point, that probably weighs in favor of fair use also. Um, the effect on the market, well, particularly if it's a graph that's in another academic journal, you know, you're probably not going to undercut the market for that journal or for that article unless the graph is the only thing that's of interest. Um, so probably you're going to be okay. It still wouldn't be bad to have gone through this whole process, you know, tick off all these boxes, keep that on file, so then if the, if the publisher of the graph ever comes to you and says, I think you infringe, you can then pull this out and say, well, I'm sorry if I did, but it looks like it was a fair use to me. Does that make sense? Okay. Sometimes you might even be able to be in a position to do crop the photograph or something like that, and show only the crop part. You know, that. It, it's difficult to say because that, that can get in some, uh, it's another part of copyright law. There is a part in creative works that gives the artist jurisdiction over their work and limits the amount that other people can tamper with it. So I don't know if you've been here long enough to remember the tiger spot, the mosaic yeah. that used to be out on Lowry Mall. While well, the university wanted to move that to a different location and under copyright law, they really couldn't without the permission of the artist. Um, and it got into a bunch of legal wrangling and mm -hmm. caused all kinds of problems. Um, so there are some other parts. They're very strange parts of the cover. There's parts dealing with the form of the keels of boats. I'm not quite sure why that's in the copyright law, but that's a specific portion. So it can it can get really hairy. So as I said, I can just cover the basics here. If you really want to get into this, you probably need to talk to a lawyer. <laughs> you get into some really nitty gritty stuff. Um, let's see where I was here. So we talked about fair use. Then finally, if you do need to get permissions, we've got a section here on seeking permission. Um, and first, just walking through this to make sure, do you really need permission? You know, it might be under Creative Commons, it might be covered by fair use, it might be in the public domain, et cetera. If you do need to get permission, you have to figure out first who owns the copyright for this thing. And I think a lot of us assume the author holds the copyright, but if you're dealing with a, a published work, they have probably signed the copyright over to the publisher. So you're probably going to be contacting the publisher's rights office rather than contacting the author. 
Um, and that is just to give the publisher ease in distributing the work so that they've got those rights in order to consult the author every time. You can also run into multiple layers of rights. So for example, if you're dealing with a musical piece, you've got the rights of the composer, you've got the rights of the performers, and you've got the rights of the recording company. So you've got three different levels of rights you have to take care of. So you might actually have to get permission from three different places to, to be able to use that musical work again. So you kind of parse that out and figure out who actually holds the rights to what. Um, if you've got, this is just flying strangely. Let's see. We've got some things here just on what needs to be covered in a permission letter when you when you ask permission. And again, you do you want to specify all these things. You want to keep on file your letter asking for permission and any response you get. You want to do this in a way that you can preserve. So written work might be better than an email message, or if you send an email message, print it off so you've got a good, secure record of what you what you asked for and what you did. Um, in some cases, we run into this a little bit with reserves, where we might need to get copyright permission from something, and there is a provision that would allow us, if, if uh, work is needed urgently for a class, we could ask for permission, make the materials available, and then if we don't get permission, if we get a response that says no, then we take it down. So we respond quickly to take something down, but we can go ahead and use it if it's a time sensitive thing and we need to do that immediately. We do have down here some um, model permission letters. So these are just some forms you can use if you need to write for permission. And then there are also different collective licensing agencies. So I men mentioned ASCAP before. This is the main permission agency for composers, authors, and publishers. <coughs> Um, there's some others for performance rights. A lot of these are groups that deal with more performing artists and that sort of thing. And then the Copyright Clearance Center is sort of the big one for um, for a lot of academic things. They handle the copyright fees for a lot of scholarly articles and things of that sort. Questions on this? Okay, let me go back here again. Um, I won't go into the details of these, but you can see we've also given some specific things. So there are things dealing with different formats for music and recordings, for software, for videos. Um, so we have sort of outlines and specifics for all of these areas. So there is a guide for Blackboard which talks about how to make those links to specific articles. There are also, I just want to mention these guidelines and best practices. I think a lot of people get frustrated with the copyright law because it is so vague um, and foggy in some ways. So various bodies have tried to make um, guidelines that are more specific. So these are ones that were included um, when there was talk about classroom, classroom copying. So they're a little antiquated. They were made in the 70s, I believe. It was 67, 75, sorry? This is under um, guidelines and best practices. So this guideline is actually referenced by the university policy. And you can see it could sound a very specific. So you may use one chapter from a book, one article from a periodical, one short story. To me, it seems a little bit restrictive. I would tend to think that fair use might allow you to do more. But if you want a safe harbor where you know this is definitely OK, all the parties involved agreed to these specific guidelines. And these are backed up by the university legal counsel as well. Um, I was talking with our legal counsel, Nancy Hawk, at one point because I, I just felt like, you know, a lot of people are trying to push the boundaries of fair use a little bit more. And I thought, we seem very constricted. And she explained, we are in one of the strictest circuits in the country. So if we were in a different federal circuit, we might be, she might feel more comfortable with us being a little more liberal in our use of, of things. But we're in a very conservative circuit. So that means the university has a higher liability. So part of her job is to make sure the university doesn't get into trouble. Um, so that's why we're a little bit more constrained. So there are these guidelines. And then again, this appears on a sidebar. There are both guidelines and best practices. And these have been developed by all different groups. So if you are interested in a particular area, you might want to take a look at some of these different things from different, different professional groups. And they've worked out their understanding of fair use in their particular context. So that might give you some more specific examples in your area. Does digital collections include software? Let's see. Let's take a look. 
I think this may be referring to the creation of visual collections, so particularly when libraries are scanning different types of things. So yeah, it's just like it's yeah. copyrights for that sort of thing. Let's see if there's anything, if we've got anything. Uh-oh, I'm stuck. Hmm. Well, let me backtrack. Again. Let's actually look under software and see if we've got any specific guidelines listed. I think one of the deals with with software is it often is sold under a license or made available under a license, so you're more often referring to a license agreement. So this seems like it's covering mainly different license issues. And then I think keeping up to date with the exemptions. A lot of this gets into case law too, which is really tricky. That's where it's really helpful to have the advice of a lawyer because they're keeping better track of the case law and would know what applies in a specific region as well. Take another look under the guidelines and see if we've got any that pertain to software specifically. I am not seeing anything specifically. If you want to send me a um, send me an email, then I will look into that further and see if I can't find you some that apply to that more specifically. Okay. Let me pause now and just see, do you all have any other questions, specific things that we haven't covered that you want to get answers about? I, I want to end up the session with talking about your own copyright and what you should do to protect your own copyright and how you handle that. But before we go there, do you have any questions about using other people's material? Someone has sent me a message asking what the penalties are, and I, I had to look that up. Um, they can be fairly steep. So they're both civil and criminal damages. Um, so copyright infringement could cost you 750 to up to 30,000 per infringement. So that could be each item downloaded from a peer-to-peer -peer file sharing thing, for example. And then uh, court costs in addition to that. And if it was a willful infringement, so you didn't just say, oh, I didn't know, but you actually had a scheme to go out and do this, the penalty goes up considerably and can include prison time. So I take it seriously. Um, and then here are some things from the university. Um, so if you wanted to see what they will do, the um, Department of IT is the designated agent for the Digital Millennium Copyright Act for campus, so they apparently got a lot of complaints from the recording industry, the movie industry, and from others about um, prohibited uses of materials. And their standard, what they have to do under the law is they have to immediately block access to that and then take action with the person who has violated it. So um, the person who's done the infringement gets a letter from them is required to go through a class may have other damages that they have to deal with. So they take it pretty seriously. So if you want to find out the details, you can follow those links through as well. These are the steps to do if you think someone has infringed your own work. And this is another thing. I mentioned that registration is not required. So, you know, your work is automatically covered by copyright. You don't have to put the copyright symbol on. You don't have to send anything into the copyright office. But there are some benefits. If you have registered your work, then it, it's a little bit more secure. And if you do contemplate having to sue somebody for infringing your work, the first thing you have to do is register it so it's, it's, there's a record on file. And then there are some various places to seek, um, seek help with dealing with that.
Okay, well, let's take a look under your own copyright, and we've just added this to this guide as of this morning. Um, so there are some things to consider. You know, you want to take your own copyright seriously, so registration would be an option. Another thing that's really important for you to consider, particularly as academic authors, is that it's typical when you publish with an academic journal that they have a, a copyright agreement, and they will usually, the default will be for you to sign over all of your copyrights to the publisher. That gives them the greatest freedom in reusing your work or distributing it, publishing it, et cetera. Um, but you don't have to sign all those rights away. So keep in mind what those exclusive rights of the copyright holder are to distribute, publicly display, et cetera. So if you want to be able to rework your article and publish a derivative work based on it, if you want to be able to post it on a website, you want to put it in the institutional repository at this institution, you might want to reserve some of those rights to yourself. And these rights don't have to all be one package. They can be unbundled and separated. So you can give certain rights to the publisher to allow them to publish, but you can hang on to certain rights so that you still have access to your own work and you do things with it or allow others to do things with it without having to go back to the publisher and ask for permission. So SPARC is an organization. It's part of the Association of Research Libraries that monitors all this, advocates for authors' rights. If you click on this link, they have a nice page talking about these issues. And one of the things that's really nice is they have an addendum. So you can actually use, they have created a legal document that will address all these issues. So you can use their addendum. I'm sure a lot of publishers are used to seeing this addendum, so they're not going to be surprised at it. So you can decide which rights you want to hang on to and which you want to designate to somebody else and use that to make that clear. Another thing you can do is consider a Creative Commons license. So you may have seen this little double C in the circle. So this is something other than copyright. And how did I get into Spanish? That is really interesting. And I'm not seeing. Where does it go into English? Yeah. English. <laughs> Let's try that. There we go. So there are a variety of licenses available, and they've got a nice little flowchart. So you can. Um, specify what kind of rights you want to hang on to, what sort of rights you want to pass on to others. And if you fill out this form, which displays better on a full screen, it generates a little symbol. And they also give you code that you can embed into an online thing. So that makes it clear. Basically, what you're doing is you're giving permissions before anyone has to come ask you. You can say, it's OK for you to use this as long as you give me proper attribution or it's OK for you to build something based on this. I don't mind. Um, so it just cuts out that whole process of having to go ask for questions. It assures people that it's OK. You are sharing something in a certain way. So we really encourage the use of that. That can be really helpful. Um, we also encourage open access publishing. We have a whole separate guide just on open access. And we'll be celebrating open access week next week, October 19th or 25th, I believe it is. So, um, sorry. Okay. So this will be um, this is a way for you to make things more accessible, um, and it's it's evolved in a couple of ways. I think part I think it started out sort of as a social justice issue, realizing a lot of developing countries did not have access to a lot of particularly medical research that was being developed. So this is a way to take that out of copyright, make it more openly accessible so that everybody could benefit from the research. Um, and among librarians, it's often seen as a way to circumvent the high cost of academic journals, where we feel like there's just excessive profits in certain publishers. And this is a way to, um, to circumvent that. There are also, um, in recent years, the federal government, since they fund a lot of research, is directing that it has to be made publicly available. It's a little bit different from open access, but at least it's publicly available for everyone to use. So there is legislation going through Congress right now, and then a regulatory directive that certain agencies, anything funded by those agencies, has to be made publicly available. So that's something you might run into. I think it's affecting mainly um, the science and technology areas, but I know in the humanities it also applies to things funded by the NEH, for example. Finally, some things you might want to check into are just university policy. There is a general university um, rules and regs on 
patent and copyright law, and this gets into some details about when the university owns something and when you own it. So particularly if you're employed by the university, you might want to look this over, it determines, and, and give some parameters for working out. If you develop something under the orders of a department, can you take that work with you? Do you hold the copyright to it, or does the university hold the copyright to it? How do you work that out? Um, so that you might want to read that over. Also, if you're publishing a dissertation, there are a couple of different forms that you have to fill out. There's an um, electronic release form, which allows us to make an electronic archival version of your dissertation or thesis. And there's a publishing agreement form, which allows the university to pass your dissertation on to the University of Microfilms Incorporated. It's now ProQuest. It's the owner of that company that makes dissertations available online. And I think with both of those, there are some ways that you can put an embargo period on things, or you can restrict some of it. I know particularly people who are, um, I'm familiar mostly with people who are writing novels or poems as part of the dissertation. They want to publish that somewhere else. So they may put some restrictions on how it can be distributed so that they don't um, undercut the possibility of publishing in another venue. So those forms are there for you to take a look at. Okay, any questions I can try to answer at this point? Okay, well, I think I've told you about all I know, which you can see it's not much. There, there are great depths to copyright. You get into a lot of deep water here. But I hope this guide will help point you to places to get some more information. Um, it can be a really interesting area to follow just to see how this is developing. Uh, and if you do have any questions that come up later on, feel free to contact us. If we don't have the answer, we'll find somebody who does and get you an answer. Thank you for coming.